We all want to get people to do stuff. Well, let me summarize the key points from this book to help you achieve the most in your life. Are you a voter? Do you vote? Well, which question actually invokes action more? It's the former. Are you a voter? Because this is using nouns rather than verbs, which actually surprisingly invokes action more. We all have a need to belong and we're influenced more by people like us, particularly if they're attractive, because we're tuned into this need for social validation and we pay attention to what others do. And when we're trying to get people to do stuff, just consider telling them how many people have done this before. So 1,500 people have already subscribed to this channel. Note, don't do this if you're talking about bad things such as drug abuse, because that can actually encourage a behavior if you give stats saying how many people have done it. So think about an initial request, and if requesting a fee, start with a higher fee, not unrealistically high, but then followed by what you actually want, because then people have that sense of bargaining. The model behavior to get others to copy, and by this, if we do something first, so we may want to mimic body language, for example, to build rapport and show that you're passionate in order to trigger emotional contagion. And that's when people you're speaking with pick up the emotions that you're feeling. The N effect, this is fascinating. Competing against smaller numbers tends to actually lead to better performance than competing against larger numbers. Now there's the SAT score in the USA that you may have heard of. I think it's a standardized test often people would take to get into universities or college as they call it. And they found that even adjusting for lots of things such as uh, deprivation, location, they found that people who sat in smaller examination settings versus these massive halls achieved better scores. Men, interestingly, do better when competing against others, whereas women tend not to improve. And if they're competing against men, um, they'll actually do worse. So what is the optimum number? Well, it's less than 10. So if we want to get the best performance, we want to aim for less than 10 participants in a particular thing with men competing against a small number of other men. And often, if we want the best performance of, from women, we just don't have them competing at all there. Now, to lead a team, we need to establish a group identity and then have an us versus them as the key concept. If you look at history, Adolf Hitler probably is the best example of this. And what you want to do as a leader is lead the group, portray confidence, and then cause the group to actually take action. Body language is useful. So hands open, touching at a 90 degree angle suggests that you have confidence in what you're saying. And you also have to make sure your hands are visible. Whereas if you move your hands a lot within your body, you may appear a bit chaotic Earlier I did that because I had hair in my eye, it's gone now. Uh, whereas if you make hand gestures that match with what you're saying, that's a powerful thing. Now dress, dress sense is important. You should either dress like people to convey a similarity or a notch above them to convey authority. This is if you're trying to be a leader, by the way. So make changes in others and yourself by deliberately developing habits. Now you can do this using cues and rewards. If you remove barriers so that your only thought is to do something, then you want to track your progress. So it may be something like going to the gym, you remove the barrier by putting your gym bag in your car, and then you go directly on the way home from work. Now stories are powerful, and it's not just the stories we tell other people, it's the stories we tell ourselves. But be aware, we can all actually edit our own story and potentially other people's stories. And if we want people to change, then the aim is to 
incrementally change their story. If, they, if however, they've got a story, like you said you're an ultra fit person, why aren't you going to the gym? That may prompt them to say why they're not going and get them back on track. But if they perceive themselves as a not fit person, you may have to slowly notch away to then help them get the most in terms of fitness. So ideally, you get people to go off their own back with their story. But as I say, if you need to change other things, other people's stories, it's very slow change. And also, if you can get somebody to publicly commit to something, that's fantastic. And they're much more likely to follow through. And you think of lots of charities, how they may do this, try and get people to declare what they've they've donated so that their friends and family normalize this and perhaps donate more. A goal gradient. Now this is if we work towards a goal or a project, we then focus on what there is left to do. And if you go to several coffee chains, what they'll do, they'll give you a card with a few pre-stamped coffees and then you only need another five or so to get your next overpriced cappuccino for free. Well, that's actually using this because it looks like you've made progress already. Now, carrots and sticks, we all know what that is, but when trying to get somebody to do something, you may want to initially have that carrot, that fixed reward, but then you want to move away and have a variable reward system. You know, you may want to also consider priming if you think of Pavlov and, and his dogs that would salivate when the bell was rang. That's a way of priming them. And you could prime people so that then when they hear or see or even smell something, it nudges them towards that desired behavior. And casinos will use this all the time with flashing lights, bells that are trying to both prompt people into a desired behavior and occasional rewards that will then reinforce action. See, we can reinforce behavior by providing positive rewards, but when doing this, we need to make sure we're giving somebody something that they actually want. Because if I offered some an incentive to you that I may think is great, you may not care about a Magic the Gathering Black Lotus Alpha Edition although you probably would when you googled it and saw how much it's worth. Equally, we want to more give the, the carrot than the stick, but negative punishment is there really as a last resort. Instincts. Now, we all as humans are primed against loss aversion, and it's important because people take steps to stop losing things. You're actually more motivated to stop losing than you are for potential gain. And when we're trying to sell things, just think of rarity. You can look on eBay, there are other auction sites available, and almost everything will say rare on it, because people want to get that rare shirt. However, people also like control. So you think, well, how do I give somebody control if I'm trying to get them to do something I want? Well, it's about making decisions. If they think they've got several decisions that they can make, several options, then they're in control. So what you may want to do is only give a few options that will almost restrict them down potential avenues that you think could be in their best interest. Because it isn't about manipulating people to get them to do bad stuff. We're talking about trying to help them here. Or at least I am. Habits. Now, I've touched on that about removing barriers, but if, if we're unhappy and we think of shopping, we're actually more likely to go with a familiar brand. I found that fascinating, whereas if we're happy, we're more likely to try something new. And if you think about trying to get other people to do things, then if you want them to do something new, do it when they're in a good mood and they'll be more likely to say yes. So this desire for mastery. Now people have a desire for mastery and that's basically a skill or knowledge that if they keep learning, 
then they'll achieve greatness in that particular area. And it's usually powered by intrinsic motivation. And this is one of the ways we can get long-term change. So I, for example, am powered by a desire to become a master at dancing salsa on two. I'm a long way away from it yet, but I maybe I'm closer than I was before, but it's an intrinsic motivation. So I'll keep going with this. But if you want other people to have a, that desire for mastery, then you may think about drip feeding them with some information because there's this desire for more. So people want more to satisfy themselves. So if you give them a small bit of information each time, it'll leave them wanting more. And there'll be more YouTube videos coming if you've already subscribed Gold Star. Tricks of the Mind. Now this classic book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is what we'd refer to as, I'll briefly explain the concept, fast thinking, in, in which people don't think about something, they just out of habit, they don't even read something, they just make the decision. And slow thinking, when we deliberately engage our thinking to make a decision. And we can utilize this to, uh, to our great benefit if we think about it, because it goes as far as even how easy it is to read text. If the text is easy to read, our brains are thinking, oh, this must be an easy thing, let's skim it. Whereas if text is difficult to read, if you don't just bin it, then you'll maybe look at it with deliberate thinking. So I believe the subscribe button's very clear down below. However, that's all about just building about fast and slow thinking. And also, if you want to keep people interested, if you can have surprises that come on in, it'll mean they're deliberately focused. So next time you're given a lecture, think of a surprise that will keep people actually engaged. And when we're making requests, think of the best way to actually do them. If we want a quick agreement, then keep it very simple. If we want a debate, then give them a challenging question. Remember, if we're interrupted, then we tend to remember the start of something. That's the primacy effect. Now, thanks for getting this far because I think the start of this video isn't as good as the middle. And that's a poor thing because people tend to forget about the middle and they remember the end. That's the recency effect. So just remember a presentation, most important things at the start and the end. So I'm gonna be ending up soon here. And I'll tell you these seven ways that you can influence others. I've mentioned them all already, but it's instincts, power of stories, tricks of the mind, that's the fast and slow thinking, need to belong, desire for mastery, habits and carrots and sticks. And if you're actually trying to change or manipulate somebody to do something in a certain way, you can use any of these seven tools, also one after another, stack them if you like. But if you're looking for long-term change, people tend to remember stories. So a story, the desire for mastery, need to belong, and habits, those are the most important things. Whereas if you're wanting short-term change, you want to tap in on mainly instincts, carrots and sticks, and then tricks of the mind. Hope you found that helpful. I look forward to seeing you next time.